Just join your family all the time. You can be seated and we'll just say the Lord's Prayer. I'm wondering if I should maybe even shut the roller door because we've got extra light and noise coming in there. Is that too too big am I done? Let's say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Let's just take a moment to lift up this song. <coughs> to the Lord, seek ye first the kingdom. Friends, welcome to Abiding in the Vine. And the virtue that we're going to look at today is one of my favorite. Discernment. Think about this word discernment and hold up in your thoughts Matthew 7, where the Lord says, Judge not, lest you be judged. 
and the measure that you meet shall be met back unto you again. That's not the complete verse, but he's warning us in judgment that what we give to others in terms of judgment, we're going to also receive back. So hold these two ideas up together. We have discernment on one hand, a virtue. And on the other, we have the Lord warning us about judgment. How do those two ideas work together? Is there an answer? Let's have a look. Reading on the front of the order of service, discernment manifests when we learn to access the wisdom of heaven through intuition and sacred text. This virtue grants one the ability to choose between truth and error, right and wrong. The ego is constantly chattering in the background and therefore time, persistence and quality times of reflection help intuition, wisdom, to intuitive wisdom to rise to the surface of the external mind. Deep within the mind lays questions coming from the divine. When we search for answers to these questions, we are on the path to wisdom created by the Lord. The further we travel this path, the greater our discernment becomes, provided we seek first the kingdom before our egocentric desires, we will grow into wise and discerning souls. Take a moment thinking about that virtue, discernment. Did something jump out for you in that reading? For me, one of the key words there is intuition. Discernment involves intuition. I'm quite comfortable with the idea of lifting discernment up to the level of wisdom. Swedenborg does himself in many passages. But when we say wisdom, our thoughts should automatically go where? To the Lord, yes. And to Celeste? The goodness of life. That's excellent. Yeah. What were you going to say there? The word. Oh, that's good. The word. Yes. Celeste, some certain kind of person, a celestial angel. Mm-hmm. Celestial angels live in wisdom. Mm-hmm. So I'm comfortable using these two terms interchangeably, discernment and wisdom. But it's not quite what we think it is. If I said to you, this, this man here, he's, or this woman here, they're such a wise person immediately invoked in your thoughts will be all sorts of ideas of what wisdom is. Perhaps they're really good at every single thing they do. Perhaps they just take time before making decisions. We each have our own idea of what a wise person is. And what's so beautiful about this virtue is it's not what we think it is. And today, particularly on the card here, I'm going to give you what I believe is the number one best key that I have found for accessing the Lord's will. Wisdom. The Lord's will. So what do we think of this idea of intuition? What's intuition to you? What do you think of intuition? Um, It's... It's type of like with wisdom, it's experience gained. With intuition, you have no experience. You. Wow. So, it, 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 so it's an arising of, of um, I wouldn't say an uncertain part, but it would be an arising of something that is totally fresh and new and exciting and exhilarating. Could I paraphrase what you just said in, in, from what I'm drawing from you said? So intuition is like wisdom, but wisdom has experience behind it. So intuition is that wisdom that we can tap into that maybe we haven't really walked it out, but we can tap into it nonetheless. I think that's really, really well said. Anyone else? Kevin, what's your idea of intuition? Uh, Inner knowing. Inner knowing. Come on, Gay, give us the... the... Inner feeling? No, I don't think that that's it. I think they balance each other beautifully because I wasn't thinking feelings at all. Inner feeling. Can you elaborate on inner feeling? 
Mm. But you use the word feeling, like bounce that off what Kevin's saying. An inner know. What, when you say an inner knowing, what does that feel like, Kevin? It's um, spontaneous. Spontaneous. Reaction or a spontaneous knowledge or a spontaneous act going. Um, and it's um, yeah. So it doesn't add. There's no judgment in it. No judgment in it. Okay, that's good. C can we all say we've tasted? It's a soul. It's a soul, soul thing. It, it's a soul thing. That's lovely. Can we all say we've experienced intuition at some time, some point? Can we all say that? As long as we all get a, get a unanimous <laughs> agreement here that we've all experienced intuition at some point. Yes. Okay. Well, then I'm comfortable for us to now just just close our eyes for a moment, take a couple of breaths, relax our thoughts and go back to a time where you were feeling intuition. And I want you to take another breath. Back to that moment where you're feeling intuition. What does it feel like? What does intuition feel like? The words we've heard are a knowing, spontaneous, something we haven't walked out and yet we know it to be true. Now, intuition is not something wooey. It's not something fluffy. It's a very real experience that we've all had at some point. It is the Lord speaking into our heart via an angel or via the word. It can be direct or indirect. But at some point, we just get this feeling that something is a certain way it is. Isn't it? I've had experiences where intuition has come to me visually. I'm talking to someone and in front of me their face changes into the face of someone else. And I immediately stopped the conversation I said, you've been talking to so-and-so and they've sent you here. And they were totally and utterly taken back that I had that knowledge. I didn't even hesitate in saying it. It was just an inner knowing. I just knew the experience of seeing their face change into that of the other person and then back again. And with it, I had an inner knowing. They were talking to that person and they were sent here to check up on me, suss me out. Did you know that one in 10 people have been stalked? That's a statistical analysis. One in 10 people have been stalked. You have somebody admiring you a little bit too much, deeply investigating you, stalking you. But without intuition, without that knowing, we have no, no way to realise we're being stalked. But we've all had that feeling, haven't we? Some, we've been watched. Someone watching me. You ever had that experience where you feel like someone's looking at you and you turn around and there is someone staring at you? It's your soul again telling you things that you can't possibly know. Or what about you're thinking of someone and then the phone rings? It's another form of intuition. And you've heard me say this one before. Uh, Jimmy Barnes walking through Bali, pushing his child in the pram with his wife, suddenly gets a really bad feeling. And he turns around and walks the other way. So he didn't know why, and that street that he was heading down was where the bomb was about to blow up. Intuition, isn't it? I can remember when Renee and I were, were dating, and we were, we were walking along Breakfast Creek, along those beautiful walks along the, the creek there in Fortitude Valley, and it was dark. Oh, we were just young, in love. Thought it'd be a nice idea, go out and have a meal, and we're walking along those. And I had this most terrible feeling come over me. It's hard to describe. Like my life was an immediate threat. I just stopped and I grabbed Renee and I said, this doesn't feel right, we're going now. And, it, and we walk away, and as I walk away, I turn around and look over my shoulder, and I could just see some strange figure coming out of the shadows, just up ahead on the walkway. Maybe, maybe nothing. 
But I can tell you this, the times where I have not trusted my intuition have costed me badly. I have suffered. And then there are times you can't prove it, and then there are the times where we've all listened to our intuition, and later on we've gone, wow, we got that one right, didn't we? Isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. So let's get into this. I want to give you the best key I know how to hear God's voice. Would you like that? Yeah. Well, we'll get through the material first. I'll leave it to last. Okay. So definition. Guan, would you read out there the definition, the dictionary definition of discernment? Definition, the ability to judge well. The power or faculty of the mind are to distinguish one thing from another and choose from forceful to choose from advice. Wow. That was about it on the dictionary. When, you, when I've looked up virtues in the past, you get sometimes you get pages definitions. And uh, this one was very short. It was very hard to identify discernment. It, it's quite challenging. The ability to judge well. Let me give you my understanding of how what the Lord meant. Judge not lest you be judged. And the measure that you meet to someone else is going to be met back to you. What the Lord, I believe, is saying to us is not that we shouldn't have judgment but we shouldn't pass judgment, isn't it? And that's the difference between discernment and judgment. Judgment belongs to the Lord. Discernment belongs to us. So it's not that we just kind of cover our eyes, you know, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. It's not like that at all. That's exactly the opposite. You know, the writings say that an angel can look at a fingernail of a person and suddenly know their whole life. Or one word or one syllable out of the mouth of the person and they can suddenly read their whole life. But it equally tells us there are some things the Lord keeps secret. It's good news, isn't it? That's good news. There's some things the Lord keeps secret, but they have this ability to protect themselves. That's what the Lord's saying. You can listen to someone. We've all listened to someone, and as they're talking, we're just, our gut's going, sounds good, doesn't feel right, doesn't it? We've all had that experience. It just, I don't know what it is, just didn't feel right. I don't think you should go for that business deal, dear. What do you know? You know nothing about business. Oh, don't listen to me then. Isn't it? Doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, so... The ability to judge well, not pass judgment, but the ability to discern between what is good and what is bad, what is right and what is wrong. Boy, do we need more of this virtue. Uh, Gay, would you read to us some synonyms? Mm. I got the right person to read those out. That's good. I would have I would have I would have balked there gay on per <laughs> Did you? Was that a ga- could you feel could you feel that I, yeah, okay. How do you say purse purse? Perspicacity, isn't it? Just flows out her lips. Perspicacity, isn't that amazing? Any other any other words jump out for people? What's a word that jumped out of that for you? Oh, by the way, that was a quarter of the list. Isn't that funny? The dict- online dictionaries, and I went to the Webster, and it gives me one short line of, of of discernment, but it can give you all these synonyms. And by the way, it literally only had two for 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 um, uh, what do you call them? Um, the opposite acronym. Antonyms, thank you, yeah. Only two. <laughs> Ignorance and stupidity. I thought it was marvellous. Ignorance and stupidity for the opposite of discernment. So words that jumped out at people there? 
Shrewdness. That jumped out at you? Yeah? Yeah. Why? Is it... Uh, You're a bit too shrewd. Yeah, oh, she's shrewd, that Bev, isn't she? She's shrewd. You're pretty switched on. I'll give you that. You don't get much over Bev. That's true. Other words? I think um, perceptiveness and perception yes. are like eye based words, where the other words seem to be almost like a we based. Uh, like a wow, did you hear that, people? Andrew, that was very insightful, Andrew. Andrew felt that the words perception and perceptiveness are, for him, were I-based words, an experience going on inside, I. But the other words tended to be a little bit more inclusive or we. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. There's a lot in the writings, Andrew, on perception. It is an, it is an amazing virtue. And as we're regenerating, we go from... Well, being stupid, I, I, I can accept that. We go from being stupid to being spiritually wise or rational is what the writings call it. We go being spiritually wise or rational and then there's celestial <coughs> wisdom which is actual perception. It's perception. And if you think about the eyes, how they perceive. If you close them, they're perceiving nothing. And then you open them, suddenly light's flowing in and you're perceiving and that's the nature of heavenly wisdom. It's not that you're walking around with some incredible understanding of life continually happening. You're just in the moment enjoying and loving and blessing. And when you suddenly need to perceive something, it's like the intuition, it just comes up. And that's why angels know that the wisdom they have is not theirs. <coughs> they just know it's the Lord's. Because the moment they need it, there it is. Isn't that interesting? I could use more of that, isn't it? We could all use more of it, and we can have more of it. Let's keep going. So, Di, would you like to read the first quote there by Ben Fountain? Ben Fountain is, a, is a, an American author. He's quite a well-written author, too. Quite a nice quote, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Did something come up for you in that? What about the pursuit of happiness? That's right out of that's right out of the American Constitution. The pursuit of happiness, not happiness itself. Very wise those men who wrote that constitution. They said that you know, you know, people should be free in the pursuit of happiness. Because the writings tell us that often once we obtain the thing we want, we lose hope. You just gotta hope that the um, majority democracy's premise rests on the notion that the collective wisdom of the majority yes. troubles we hear too much of the minority. I don't want to get all political, but we don't hear enough of the collective wisdom of the majority. We hear too mm. much of the agitation of the minority. So, so long as that is going on, mm -hmm. then we are being denied the uh, capacity, the growing capacity for discernment and self-correction. And I feel that's happening. We're being denied that capacity for growing discernment. However. Not at all. I, no, no, not at all, Ian. In fact, I would, if it makes you feel any better, my turn to step out and risk. Can I step out and risk here? I want to tell you what I believe is the most dangerous word today in our political, social, economic environment. Are you ready? Have you got your stones? <laughs> Just, uh, so, sorry? Me? Self? No. Are you ready? The word inclusion. I believe that is the most dangerous word alive today. 
the writings teach us that heaven is variegated, infinitely variegated. But heaven is not a place of inclusion, folks. It is not. It is not. It is a place of protection. The very atmosphere of heaven discludes those that want to rape, kill, hurt children, steal, lie. They don't like the atmosphere. They flee heaven. That is not inclusion. Now, the problem with this word and why it's so dangerous is because it's founded on the idea of compassion, which is a beautiful thing, is it not? Inclusion. We want you know, compassion. We want to include people. We don't want to exclude people. But there are times and places we need to. That's what a prison's for. That's why we have to have discernment sometimes. If everybody sits in the class and we feel sorry that some are not achieving, so we'll just include them all and give them a pass. We have not helped people. We have not helped them at all. It's not good. And I'm, I mean, we need systems to help people that are struggling. Absolutely. But the answer is to not just give everybody a pass. It's all inclusive. Or however you want this word, it's being used in very manipulative ways. It's been thrown at people when we're trying to help lift the standard. Well, you're not inclusive enough. It's used in a, in a, in a dangerous way in a way that's even to suggest that people are hateful if they're not inclusive. Okay, no, I, I, I put myself out there on the limb. You don't have to like me. I don't want you to like me. Okay, it's your problem. But it's, it's a responsibility to say inclusion is, is, is built on compassion, and that's a good thing. But compassion needs to marry wisdom and discernment. Without that, it's on its own. It's isolated. Okay? Compassion and love are beautiful. Love is love. And wisdom is wisdom. And they need each other. All right? There you go. I put myself out on the limb. I didn't get stoned. You're all with me, eh? That's good. Yes. Okay, let's, let's keep going. Uh, the next quote there, Ken? So a person goes into a relationship needy, they are not going to have the to Wow, that's a powerful statement. Jennifer O'Neill, she's a, a Brazilian American model and actor and author. Quite an amazing person. Isn't that an amazing statement? You know, when when you let your needs drive you, you're going to lack discernment. It's okay to have needs, just don't let them be the driver in the seat. Yeah, and Kevin, would you want to read us the next one there? Yeah, um, discernment um, is God's call for intercession, never to fault find it. Beautiful. We all know who Corrie Ten Boom is, don't we? Never heard of her, Ken? You're a teaser, aren't you? She she knew what suffering was, didn't she? Corrie Ten Boom? Yeah. Ian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Ken's being honest. Okay, Curry, Curry Ten Boom, she was, uh, she was a prisoner of war uh, in, in the Jap was it the Japanese? The Japs. Yeah. And she suffered and she survived and she came out an amazing Christian. She has touched so many lives and she's talked about forgiveness. She's talked about the things that she learnt while she was in prison and this is one of them. This idea, her quotes are amazing. Can just go and Google Corrie Ten Boom quotes. She's an amazing woman. But here she's saying exactly what, what she's really brought out the essence of discernment. Discernment is not passing judgment. Discernment is having judgment and then finding the way to love people with that judgment. Isn't that, isn't that nice? It is a call to intercession, not to fault find. Beautiful. And I try to do that. You know, when we, when we bring up someone who's got an issue, remember, Kevin, we were talking about someone who was causing issues in a meeting you were in. And my first instinct was, let's pray for them. Let's, let's stop and pray for them because it's too easy for the, for the dragon sitting inside our mind and heart to jump up and start devouring and spitting fireballs. You know, got to keep on top of that dragon. When, when, when you suddenly feel that judgment rise up, start praying for the person. What were you going to say there? Yes, intercession, explore it, go, go. She means in a prayerful, a Christian prayerful way, intercession 
So uh, intercessory prayer in mainstream Christianity is really a, a calling in ministry. There are people who feel called to intercessory prayer, meaning you see a problem. So, for example, is there a bit of political upheaval in America right now? Oh, yeah. So what does the Bible say? It says, pray for your leaders. So but the next time you want to open your mouth and criticise you know, the Prime Minister of Australia or the Prime Minister of England or the President of America, before you open your mouth, make sure you've stopped and prayed. Because the Bible says, pray for our leaders. And that's intercessory prayer. Yeah, you're interceding for someone. So what would you pray? Lord, give our leaders wisdom. Because they need it. Give them discernment. They need it, yeah. I'll say amen to that prayer. That sounds great. Sure. Mm. Yep, sure. Well, that's good. Isn't there growth in the struggle? Right? Yeah, there's growth in the struggle too. That's so the same that's involved in that. Yeah, we're going to get to an amazing quote here soon, Kevin, about that very struggle. It's, it's a good point you bring up. Yeah. It must be why the Lord kind of lets us start out such infantile, stupid and ignorant creatures and even, are not even able to walk and feed ourselves and clothe ourselves. Isn't it interesting? Every other animal comes out running. We come out dependent on parents for the next 20 plus years. It's true. Oh, I think the struggle's there for the parent. Isn't it? I think we're the ones who are really changing. Yeah, okay, so go on, Ken, read us a few more. Do um, we know who Charles Swindle is? Uh, yeah, uh, no, actually, I probably don't, but anyway. We need discernment in what we see and what we hear and what we believe. That's nice. He's a very famous American preacher. I think he was, <coughs> I think he was Baptist, yeah, radio preacher and TV preacher. We need discernment in what we see, what we hear, and what we believe. Isn't that true? Even what we're believing, we need discernment in. My goodness. You know, Jesus said, if you... Actually, if I get this right, he said, whosoever. Whosoever. He didn't say Christian. He said, whosoever says to that mountain, be thou removed. And he doubts not. But what he says he will have, he shall have it. So we need discernment in what we believe or say we believe. It's easy to say I believe something, but deep down I'm not. Uh, go, go on, read us. Is, is discernment in that instance uh, like um, ob observation, the ability to observe? I think that's well said, observe Kevin. Observe I think it's well said. Observe. For me, I'd be observing what am I feeling as opposed to what am I saying? Are they congruent? Because a double-minded man thinks he will get something from God, he will not. He'll get nothing from God. A double-minded man, you can say one thing with your mouth, in your external mind, and deep down, you're ignoring those feelings. But look, as you say, it's a growth to get to the will of God, isn't it? We'll get there soon. We should not fret for what is past, nor should we be anxious about the future. Uh, men of discernment deal only with the present moment. Beautiful. Fourth century Indian philosopher. Isn't that amazing? How, how wise. We shouldn't fret about the past, nor should we be uh, anxious about the future. Men of discernment deal, or people of discernment deal only with the present moment. Isn't that beautiful? And you can only do that if, you, if you've got faith in God, I really believe. Faith in God teaches you to not worry about the past or be anxious about the future. Why? Because long before I came, God was there. And long after I'm gone, God will be there. He's got it all under control. Isn't that also a hint at um, karma? So although you're not fretting about the past, you're conscious of the past. Although you're not anxious about the future, you project, uh, you know, like based on the past, the outcome will be. So it's discerning, you know, the karmic balance between mm. 
in, in the Bhagavad Gita, it's in the middle of a battlefield, and Arjuna is a warrior, and his duty was to fight. And on the other side were all his family members. So he was torn between family members and his religious duty to fight. And he was worried about the karmic reaction there, terribly. And Krishna said, and I'm not advocating Krishna here, but the point is there's wisdom even there in the ancient church. Krishna said very... Now, imagine this was Jesus saying this to us now. Krishna said, Arjuna, abandon all fear and anxiety about future things to come. Look unto me and do unto me. Do what you have to do unto me and I will absorb all karmic reaction. Which is another way of Jesus saying, you know, just look, stop worrying about the results. Let go of the ego. Do it out of love to the Lord and let the chips fall where they fall. They will fall where they need to fall. It's very wise, yeah. Letting go of that karmic sense of... But, but I think it's also acknowledging the past. It's acknowledging the past, past. yes. Or, or discerning the actions taken in the past right. to the possible actions in the future. Right. But live now with that understanding. Right? Or make your deeds with that understanding of the ramifications of the two extreme of worlds. Yeah, no, so, so Andrew, the challenge there, and I, I agree with you completely, how do we acknowledge the past and not get into anxiety? That, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, 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 that's a beautiful state to be in where we can acknowledge the past and be at peace in the present. That's kind of what you're looking at? Yeah. 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 So we're not being foolish about the past, right? We're not ignoring it, we're not being blind to it. Is that kind of... Yeah, or accepting past actions. You know, you know like the, the wild man that you know, sows his oats presently it brings pre um, a pregnancy... But the future is the birth of the baby, you know. So it's yeah. maybe I'm not key. No, it's good. Yeah, I, it's, it's like good. that type of thing. Is is actions done in the past will have present day ramifications. Right. So you have to make pre preparations for the oncoming. You birth. have to be responsible. Um, yeah. Yeah. Be wise and responsible. Yeah. 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 Does um does using past. Um, um, stop us from relying on, on intuition? Good question. If we drag old past experiences to the... What do we think here? <laughs> what, what do we think? Does drawing on the past stop us from tapping our intuition? Is that kind of the question? I think the answer is in that Ben Fountain. Um, mm -hmm. Over time, its capacity for discernment and self-correction will be enlarged. Will be enlarged. Yeah. So I think the answer is it, it can. It just depends on if we're bringing the past into the light of heaven's wisdom. If we are, then like Ian's saying, it'll enlarge and we'll learn. This is why the message of the writings is so beautiful, because God is not judging us. It's not about God trying to catch us out. You broke that commandment. You're out. It's, just not, it's not about It's about us learning. And there are commandments because God is wise. And he doesn't want us to have to suffer. And I remember this as a young, young Christian. Felt like the Lord was saying to me, saying, look, you can learn through faith or you can learn through the school of hard knocks. I want you to learn through faith. And what I felt the Lord was saying to me was, trust me. You don't need to take heroin to know that it's seductive and will destroy your life. Isn't it? We can just look at those who've gone before, you know. So faith is, you know, faith is about learning. But sometimes we need to learn from the school of hard knocks too. We have our prodigal moments, don't we? We need to, yeah. So it's a good question, Kevin. We can bring, I would say, bring the past in as the divine invites it. Too much nasal gazing will harm you. I don't reflect on things in the past until the Lord puts his finger on it. And then when he does, I don't ignore it. Don't ignore it when the Lord's putting his finger on the past. Because there's something beautiful he wants to teach us from that. Yeah. Okay, so the spiritual quotes. Ming, would you like to read that? Would you, would you, no? She wants Kevin to read it for Kevin, you want to read the next one for us? Spiritual quotes. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, um, I might have to pass on any of the Thessalonians. Yeah. That's good. Um, quench not the spirit, uh, despise not uh, prophesizing. 
prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Now that's a beautiful passage because when we, we were looking at this, weren't we, Gay, at your house at the, when we did the study on the Holy Spirit, gifts versus power. No, sorry, um, fruit. <laughs> gifts of power versus the, <coughs> the fruit of the Spirit. You can have God activate gifts in your life. And then once they're active, they're active. He doesn't take them away. It's not an evidence that you're following God because you're using a gift in your life. And he's saying here, Paul's saying, don't quench that. Let people explore these spiritual gifts. You know, don't quench that. Let them prophesy. Let them do these things. But in doing it, test all things. Just because someone is speaking insight into you, about you, doesn't mean it's good. I, I was a, a young, young Christian, or only weeks into knowing the Lord, and this other young person came up to me and he said to me very harshly, you're doing blah, 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 blah. And they were right in what they were saying. And I went away. I felt terrible. And then I went to the Lord. I don't know why I didn't think about doing it earlier. And I went to the Lord and said, Lord, what do you say? And the Lord said, yes, you're doing blah, 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 blah. But I love you. This is okay. Work on this. Do that. And I suddenly felt better. I thought, what's going on there? And the Lord said, you can speak the truth not in love. And what happens is the person wanting the truth grabs hold of the truth and takes all that yuckiness in with them as well. All that downcastness, the judgment, the harshness. So only the Lord speaks the truth into your life and will bring love with it as well. Or as I remember Chris once saying to me years ago, only Jesus can cut you up into a thousand pieces and you say thank you for it afterwards. Isn't it? The Lord, Lord has a way of putting his finger on you and you feel loved. We have a way of putting our finger on people and they feel disgusting because we're talking out of our ego. But we can talk out of love too. People will feel it when you're talking from love. So, yeah, just be aware of that. He's saying, look, don't stop people from speaking forth insight and wisdom and deep things, but be careful. Listen, feel the fruit of that spirit. Do you feel loved, built up, nurtured, kindness, or do you feel judged? Do you feel worthless? Do you feel put down? Then that was truth spoken, but not from the Lord, from another spirit. Hmm? Yeah, okay. So Ian, do you want to read for us the, the next passage? Yeah. 1 John, beautiful passage this. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Wow. And at the time that was written, the Gnostics were becoming quite popular. Now, the, not all Gnostics were bad, but there were a particular branch of Gnostics that taught material creation was completely an illusion, completely a lie, it wasn't real, and where it caught in an illusion under a, a false deity called Jehovah. But... The true deity has come down in Jesus Christ. He didn't actually come down because matter is evil. It was all a vision and apparition. Now this has some serious complications to it to say that Jesus didn't physically walk the earth. And that's why John's saying, look, know the true spirit of God. Uh, it teaches that God became Christ on earth. And the writings go into a great deal to explain why the Lord had to manifest physically on earth. To save us. It's quite, we could never go into it right now. We'd need weeks to dig into it, really. But the point again here is this beautiful revelation that if someone's denying the Lord, they're not operating from a spirit of light. It's worth remembering that. Uh, Bev, do you want to read to us, Jose? Hosea. Hosea, yep. Yeah. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the righteous will walk in them. Wow. But transgressors will stumble in them. What's your thoughts on that one? 
beautiful, isn't it? Can we know the will of God? Yes, most certainly. Absolutely. Is it a challenge, a growth, a struggle? Yes, it's definitely a growth. Why? What is the thing that stands in our way the most? Us. Yes, us. That's a wee word for you, Andrew. I'm happy to say me. I stand in the way. Me. Ego. Self. Go on, Jordan. Would you read for us Philippians? Did we want to do Samuel? Oh, Samuel. Go on. Do them both. Um, but the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Beautiful. You know the Bible says your heart is deceitful above all things? You can't trust your heart. But once you've handed over to the Lord and truly handed it over, you can trust your heart. It's just knowing whether you've done that or not. So, And of course he's talking about Saul here. The people chose Saul because he was really tall, really strong, really powerful. David was a little runt. He was a short little runt of a fellow. He wasn't that impressive to the eyes. But he could take Goliath down when Saul couldn't. Isn't it? Yeah. Because David knew the Lord. And that's the difference. We need to know the Lord. We need to look after the things, the Lord's view of things, not man's view of things. And Philippians, Jordan? And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. Wow. That's beautiful. Thoughts on that? No? Paul said to Timothy, we were reading this in the car on the way in, weren't we, Jordan? Paul said to Timothy, keep watching your doctrine and your life, for by that you will save your soul and those that listen to you. Well, that's not once saved, always saved, or faith only, isn't it? Paul said to Timothy, keep watching your life and your doctrine. In that you will save your soul and those that are listening to you. Pretty, pretty important stuff. We've got to have self-discernment here in the sense of discernment. Look at this amazing passage on the back here. Divine love and wisdom, 422. Our discernment does not become spiritual and heavenly. Huh? What? Does it make sense? Nope. Our discernment does not become spiritual and heavenly. Our love does. Mm. And when it does, it makes its spouse discernment spiritual and heavenly as well. Thus the Bible says, watch your heart. It's deceitful above all things. When your heart's chasing selfish things, your discernment will be off. It'll be off. It won't even be working. But when your heart is seeking love, then discernment will then be lifted up into uh, heavenly wisdom. Love becomes spiritual and heavenly through a life in accord with the truths of wisdom. Truths that, dis uh, truths that discernment teaches and illustrates. Love absorbs these truths, not on its own, but by means of discernment. Since love cannot lift itself up unless it knows truth. So how am I going to tell if my heart is deceiving me? I need the Lord's truth. And it can know truth only by means of discernment that has been lifted up and enlightened. Then love is lifted up to the extent that it loves these truths by doing them. Wow. It's so easy to give intellectual consent to the truth, isn't it? To speak it with your mouth. And your heart's far from it. And that's what the Lord said. He said, it was at Jeremiah. These people honor me with their lips. Their hearts are far from me. But the Lord also promised he would put a new heart in us. Not a stony heart. One that cries out, Abba, Father. Isn't it? Say after me, Lord. Lord. You are my Father. You are my Father. I trust you. I, trust you. I love you. I cry out for relationship with you. I cry out for relationship with you. Amen. Mm. 
So these, then love is lifted up to the extent that it loves these truths by doing them. It is one thing to discern, that is, and another to intend. Once you're intending, discernment has made its way into the will. It's impregnated it. It's inseminated it. It's one thing to discern, it's another to intend. Or it is one thing to speak, and it's another to act. There are people who understand truths of wisdom and utter them, but still do not intend and do them. When love then puts into practice the truths of light that it discerns and utters, then it is raised up. Wow. So, Swinburne saw examples of where he wanted to make this point really, angels wanted to make this point really clear. So, these angels went and grabbed someone, an unevolved soul, one of the devils, and then he said, watch. And he brought this devil up into heavenly light, and then that devil stopped its rambling and its madness and started speaking great wisdom. This devil was even able to go, I know that what I'm now saying is the truth. And that I should seek it. But I also know that I'm not going to want it once I'm let out of this light. And that's exactly what happened. The devil was then let out of that light and it went back to its ramblings. Isn't that amazing? That's why we teach in the new church the importance to, to not just hear the truth, not just to know the truth, but to discipline our lives with it, to practice it. That's what gives us real discernment. It's, it's dangerous to think that you can discern just intellectually on truth alone. You can't. This key, I want to give you this key. Let's go to the card. Let's, let's go to the card. <laughs> discernment. The power to judge between right and wrong, truth and error. John 5.30, one of my favourite New Testament Bible verses. I can of my own self do nothing. I hear and I judge and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. And divine love and wisdom 4.2.2. Love that has been cleansed in our discernment, love that has been cleansed in our discernment, becomes spiritual and heavenly. We are born earthly, but to the extent that our discernment is raised into heaven's light and our love into heaven's warmth along with it, we become spiritual and heavenly. Then we become like a garden of Eden, bathed in light and warmth of springtime. Isn't that beautiful? Say after me, Lord, you are making my heart into the garden of Eden where New Jerusalem shall reside. Amen. How would you like to hear inside you and what you hear and what you judge is correct? Every hand should go up. Come on, every hand should go up. Think about it. It's an act of prayer. Put your hand up. It's an act, put your hand up. It's an act of prayer. Wouldn't you like to hear and judge and know that what you're hearing and judge is correct? Yeah. Let's read it again. John 5.30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. I, because, here's the key, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. That's the key. Okay, that's the key. You need to take your will, and you need to put it on the altar of God, and you need to give it to Him. And then as you walk out of the temple... Just realize you just put it back in your back pocket. In other words, you need to keep taking your will and putting it back on the altar. And keep taking your will and putting it back on the altar. And no one can lie to you but you. You'll know whether you've left it there or not. And when you've left it there, and you've truly left it there, I promise you, when you say, Lord, what do you say? What you hear and what you judge in there will be correct every single time. Well, how do I get there, Darren? Okay, so Lord, I'm asking you for a really important question here. Should I marry this person? Or Lord, should I make this investment? Or Lord, should we sell this and do this? Lord, should I do this ministry thing? And you're struggling, right? 
We've all been there. You're struggling. Don't make a decision while you're struggling. Keep putting your heart back on the altar. And when you get to the place where you've stopped the struggle, no one else can tell you this but you and you alone. That's why you're the only one who can lie to yourself about this. You'll know whether you've left your heart on the altar. When you want God's answer more than you want your will, you'll get it every time. You'll hear it clear, almost audibly, every single time. But the challenge is to not keep putting your will in your back pocket as you walk out of the temple of God. Well, that's what I found anyway. He's saying here, the Lord is saying in here, his very soul will not lie to him because his very soul is Jehovah. We don't have that. But we can take the key here. When we are wanting to do our Father's will, more than we're wanting our own will, you will hear, and you will hear heaven speaking so clearly, you will know the mysteries of other people's hearts. Are they lying to me? Yes. Or no. And you'll know. But if you're invested, if you're wanting a yes, or you're wanting a no, you'll be lying to yourself. Do you understand the context? You have what I'm saying here? Put your heart on the altar and keep putting it on the altar and keep putting it on the altar until you know that you're in a place that all you want is God's answer more than your own will. And you will hear heaven speak. Yes? Amen. Let's read the meditation and close. Let's read it together. I take time to listen for your voice and guidance. I trust my intuition as part of your leading. I choose not to rush important decisions. I take special care when reading sacred texts, looking for your wisdom. I look for your signs of guidance in everyday events. I am thankful, Lord, for your gift of discernment. It leads me into paths of righteousness and life. I am safe within your wisdom. Amen. Join me in singing a new commandment as we close the word and then I'll say a benediction. A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you that you love one to another, by this shall all men know, you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. The Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord make his face shine upon you and lift his countenance upon you. The Lord give you his peace. So hopefully you're encouraged and you've got some more keys. Uh, let's have a cup of tea and...